Deputies spending hours combing through the trash at Northwest Regional Landfill off 195th Avenue and Deer Valley in surprise. MCSO says strong evidence led homicide detectives here on March 29th, just four days after their investigation began. We're just digging around the spots where they think it, the professor is. That's a landfill employee who asked to remain anonymous. He also says detectives must have an idea of where in the valley the body came from and on what day, based on their targeted searching. So his truck is tracked on the dumpings and everything they put it in a log. And after months of searching, MCSO has found the remains of missing ASU professor Jun Suk Che. MCSO spent more than three hundred thousand dollars and seventy-two hundred man hours searching for Che's body. Several ASU students telling me they were told their professor, who has the same name, went missing in March and was later replaced. Now, Professor Che teaches several engineering courses at ASU and is involved in several research projects on brain and lung functions, even creating a wireless prototype for safer brain implants. He also holds four patents and has his own book. Professor was reported missing at the end of March. His car tracked to Shreveport, Louisiana. That's where officers questioned Javian Izell and Gabriel Austin, both 18 years old. Investigators say Che was killed near Carefree Highway and 7th Street. His body put in a dumpster that was then emptied into the Northwest Regional Landfill. Both of those teenagers are in a valley jail on a million dollars bond each. No word at this hour on a motive. While family and friends want justice, it won't bring the professor back. An ASU coworker telling me he was an incredibly kind man, a brilliant mind, and will be missed by everyone he knew. It's a tragic case, um, but, you know, there's a couple aspects to this whole thing. There's the alleged motive. What exactly would be the reason? Why was he uh, out? Was he, and was he lured out there with the promise of sex? We'll get into some of that, but I want to show you the map of where all these things took place to give you a little bit of perspective here. Arizona State University uh, in Tempe, Arizona, that's where uh, Professor Che was reported missing March 25th after not showing up for work. Now, let's move from there to 7th Street and Carefree Highway in Phoenix. That is where he was allegedly killed and placed into a dumpster. Prosecutors say it was by these two suspects. Now, placed in the dumpster... That dumpster was picked up, and then his body was eventually found at the Northwest Regional Landfill. That is all the way in Surprise, Arizona. Uh, the dumpster was taken there. The body was found not until July 17th. Now, let's show you where the suspects were found. Nowhere near any of this. You've got to travel all the way across the country down to Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, where officers contacted uh, detectives on March 30th in regards to a suspicious vehicle with the, 18, the two 18-year-old suspects in it and a third individual. Officers say the car belonged to Che, and the three gave statements that then led the officers to believe Che was the victim of a homicide. Then the two defendants, Zell and Austin, were extradited to Arizona. So that gives you a little idea of where all this took place and how the case was was seemingly solved, which was through statements made by the suspects. Let's bring in our guest tonight, joining us from Phoenix, Arizona, the attorney who represented Jody Arias, but I have to say, Kirk, but hates her more than you do. Kirk Nurmi is back with us. <laughs> Kirk, you know, I, I speak with uh, criminal defense attorneys every night on the show, and a, a lot of times when they have an opportunity, they kind of throw in there, listen, if you get arrested, keep your mouth shut. This is an, a, a prime example. I mean, if if these suspects didn't say anything, I have a feeling that Professor Che would never have been found. That's quite possible, Vinny. Um, but remember, obviously, they were found in his car. So there was a connection. There was a jumping off point for police to, to begin with. The other thing I'd say, remember, when we talk about this possible confession of one or, or the other, we also have this third person in the car. What did they say to him? Was he the person who gave these details? So it's really going to, when trial begins, we're really going to see some of these details sort out. But it certainly is an example, Vinny, of why uh, defense attorneys tell people to 
keep their mouth shut. And which is why we always say, yeah, I guess if you have nothing to hide, go ahead, speak, speak. <laughs> you know, but here's the thing, Kirk. I, they couldn't have found his, his, his remains because they had to find out, first of all, where this, uh, the murder took place. So that took them to uh, 7th Street and Carefree Highway. And then they had to get the information about the dumpster. And then they had to follow that to the landfill. And it took forever in the landfill. I mean, if they never get that information about where it took place and where his body was, was put in that dumpster, dumpster, there's no reason to search that landfill. There would have been no reason to look for any of the evidence that was found on 7th Street and, and Carefree Highway either. Oh, there's no doubt about it, Vinny. The evidence, the the statements, whether which defendant they were made from, or even the third party, if they went into detail, they would never have found that body because it was very specific. And remember, they knew the area of the dumpster, as you just showed a few minutes ago, and that allowed authorities to know where to search on this huge landfill because otherwise they wouldn't have known where to begin or even know that Professor Shea's remains were left in a dumpster to begin with. Do you know anything about this area, this carefree highway in 7th Street area? Uh, you know, is it just a regular downtown area? Are you familiar at all? Yeah, I mean, it's outside of town, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not on the outskirts of town. It's part of the part of the northern area. It's a, it's a decent area of town, yeah. But it's not in the middle of the desert, right? It's not like in some, like, really isolated place where necessarily no one's going to see anything, where you're, you know, I'm picturing Breaking Bad. Right. I'm picturing like meeting because part of the story that we're hearing is that there was, a, you know, we're going to meet in the desert for this sexual rendezvous was 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 what I've heard reports might be the potential reason why uh, the professor was meeting with these with these people. Well, no, 7th Street and, and the Carefree Highway is not out in the middle of nowhere. It is kind of an open public area and it does raise the questions regarding what exactly took place, whether it was off in some other location or did the actual crime happen at that location? What elements of it happened at that location before the body was placed in the dumpster? How do you see things developing here in this case? Uh, what's, the, what's the status of trials right now in Arizona, by the way? Well, trials have been pretty backed up. We see we've got a pretrial conference coming in March. I don't know, like typical procedure would be for these uh, two defendants to go into a settlement conference to see if the case can be resolved. That might not have been an option uh, given the given the state of affairs. But I think what we're going to see a lot, we're going to learn a lot on the 11th because we're going to see the witnesses, if anybody's made a plea deal, anything of that nature, uh, to really see whether this trial is going forward. But depending on the statements, Vinny, this might be a, a slam dunk for the state. Absolutely could be. Um, and then anytime there are co-defendants, even if they're boyfriend, girlfriend, we know at any moment one can turn on the other. Um, from your experience in, in a case where you've got a, a, a young man and a young woman, do, do you think investigators or prosecutors would look at it one way or the other as one being more culpable than the other and maybe dangling something in front of one of the two defendants here? Well, yeah, it's quite possible. And remember, Vinny, these defendants we're talking about are 18 at the time of the crime. So they're looking at their whole life ahead of them, their whole life in prison. And that is a big way to, to twist a, twist an arm of a defendant, right, that the police or the prosecutors would have. So I think culpability is going to be the issue here. What statements were made? How detailed were they? And was one person more culpable than the other? Because the less culpable person would probably be running to run uh, to the prosecutor and strike a deal. And I know certainly if I had the less culpable defendant uh, as my client, that's exactly what I would be doing. And what are your options in Arizona once you, once you get into the world of, of murder? I mean, how do you get, what do you have to plead to to get something less? They're 18 years old. So, I mean, you could have a long sentence and they could still have, uh, you know, get out and have some semblance of a life. So what are sort of the options that could potentially be out there? Well, there's second degree murder, there's manslaughter. We get it under 10 years. Maybe the age will be taken into consideration, their cooperation, that sort of thing. So I would guess that they could, either one of them with the right pre-deal could be out in 10 years or less and, and maybe have a term of probation after that. But I think there would be a lot of incentive 
uh, for somebody to uh, provide the sort of details uh, in the courtroom, and especially a co-conspirator, that would be uh, that would make the the slam dunk even even more uh, powerful for the state. Absolutely, what you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Kirk, that's Nermy. right, Vinny. Absolutely, Kirk. Great to see you. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.